All righty. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Season 4, Episode 8 of In the Summer Cricket Podcast. It is your boy, Nuan, here once again, introducing the show. And alongside with me, I have the ever-knowledgeable Hasith. Uh, Hasith, how, how you been? How's the week been? I'm loving the uh, Sri Lanka um, top you got going on. It's been a it's been a good couple of days for, for Lanka in the Asia Cup. Yeah, yeah, no, I've been good. Uh, absolutely loving what Sri Lanka performing. I've been uh, presenting to the cricketing world as of late. But yeah. Um, yeah, 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 I've been doing really well. How about yourself? I've been good. I've been good. It's uh, it's it's you know, it's nice to see uh, you know the Asia Cup but get underway. Ra- a lot of rain affected games. Um, a lot of a lot of interesting white ball happening. Uh, white ball cricket happening of late, and uh, I'm 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 keen to discuss how all these developments unfold because it's a bit hard to predict what we're going to expect coming into the uh, 50 over World Cup later in the year. Um, but today's episode is a bit different to all our listeners and viewers. Um, We've got a special guest on the show today. He's a he's a very dear colleague of mine, a, a bloke that I've known for well over a decade. Um, he's a he's a sports tragic. He loves his N, uh, NBA, AFL, um, and he's you know he being Lankan as well. Of course, cricket is in the blood. Um, he's a he's a bloke that I've had yeah you know a very long friendship over a very long time, and his career story is quite inspirational because he. Uh, just like myself, he he transitioned into the world of sports media and journalism, um, you know, after being in another field for a long time, and he's doing remarkably well at it. He's uh, none other than the sports producer at the Wild World of Sports at Channel Nine, Mr. Chris De Silva. Chris, thank you so much for coming down. Uh, how you been? Thank you for having me, boys. Um, I've been good. Been good. Um, lots of sport happening this time of year, uh, <laughs> whether it's footy, cricket. You know, basketball season starting now. Premier League, what it's it's the best time. It's it's our Christmas, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's good. I love what you guys are doing. So, I'm uh, honored to be part of it. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. Look, I've been wanting to get you on the show for a while because uh, you you honestly were a little bit like my inspiration when I sort of wanted to jump into um, sports media ages ago. Um, you know, oh yeah, I also want to let everyone know this. Uh, Chris is also the uh, nephew of uh, former Sri Lanka fast bowler. Uh, Chilling the vast as well. That's always another little. <laughs> I mean, from the slide in. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Definitely slide that one in there. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but now, look, Chris. I mean, um, for all our listeners as well, you know, tell us a little bit about your career story because it is quite, quite a special one. And I remember the days how you like hustled really hard to to get into that, and um, you know, sort of your pathway journey. Like, how did it all start for you? Yeah, man. It was. Um interesting i i guess to tell the whole story i've got to go back to you know late high school year year 12 yeah and you know you you boys know as growing up um as Sri Lankans, we're sort of yeah taught that you know you have like three or four different career paths you can be the an engineer a doctor <laughs> a lawyer or in finance right like yeah. there's only four so yeah. it's either you got to figure out how you fit into one of those four doors Mm. um and then that's it that's your whole world so you know growing up if you talk to anyone who knew me or my parents whatever i used to like i was just such a sport nerd like mm. i like would play like shane Warne cricket and like <laughs> run mute and commentate myself like yeah. oh, i'd yeah. like i'd like or like play a computer game and then type up the scorecards like they like they would be on Quick Info using the same mm. fonts. Like I was a geek, absolute geek. So, you know, I'd or like I'd play yeah, play a game and then like pretend I was like presenting like the post game yeah. show. Like this is oh, stuff that I used to do in my spare time. So, yeah. looking back now, I'm like yeah, of course I should have been a journalist, but growing up that wasn't presented as an option for us and yeah. um so yeah i went through you know high school um did did the asian six in year 12 yeah. um <laughs> as we all do <laughs> yeah as we all do exactly yeah. right and um yeah my top score in year 12 was in english like mm. still didn't take the hint mm-hmm. um, so i ended up i you know to be honest finished high school didn't really know what i wanted to do and mm. um a lot of my friends who did the same subjects one they went on to do bachelor of science at melbourne so i thought mm-hmm. yeah like this is just a natural path i've always been told that yeah i'm like a 
good numbers person, good with maths, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So I just mm. thought, yeah, like, that's a progression. And as I'm doing it, I'll sort of, the, the fire will start burning, if you like. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I was, yeah, like, two years into it and just really um, everything was a grind. Like, yeah. ev every assignment, you know, was a grind. <laughs> and I just felt really out of my depth. I didn't understand what was going on. And yeah. Um, mind you, like the effort put in was wasn't optimal at times as well. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I was yeah. a great student. You know, first year uni, you, yeah. you're not doing, yeah. yeah. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I just knew that it, it wasn't natural. Like, mm. and I wasn't getting things like, you know, my friends were they were just understanding stuff, and I was just yeah, I felt really out of my depth, and so. Mm. I remember um, it was end of second year. Um, I was studying for an exam and it was like really late at night. And I got to the point where, you know, when you're studying sometimes and you sort of, you're reading stuff on a on a book or whatever, but mm -hmm. your eyes are just bouncing off the, yep. like you're not absorbing anything. Mm -hmm. So I was doing that and then <laughs> I was like, oh, there's no point. Like, I'm just miserable. I just want to do something that I enjoy doing. So I just closed it and I mm. opened a WordPress. This is mine. This is all happening at 3 a.m. Yeah. I, like, that's when all the best up... ideas come out, right? That's Absolutely. The... That's yeah, all yeah. The, uh, yeah. Inspiration <laughs> hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I opened up a WordPress and then I wrote an article on Kyrie Irving because I was a big, big, mm. I'm a big Cavs fan. And yeah. he, I think he was in his rookie year. So wrote that and then i was like yep cool like on wordpress you could like auto link it to your twitter account i had like two followers so i was like yep cool like That'll get this out <laughs> give, give the people what they want <laughs> fantastic <laughs> and and then i was like oh yeah like mm. cool like that was just a good stress reliever and then mm -hmm. i was getting ready to like close close off for the night and go to sleep and i was like closing my tabs and then I got to the emails was my first tab and I'd got this new email from WordPress and I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, and it was uh, saying that someone had commented on my, the thing I'd written. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, and when read the, read, read the comment and they were like, oh, we really like this. Um, we'd like you to write for our blog or whatever it is like their, their website. And boy, it's like, cause it was at 3 a.m. Like I'm like delirious <laughs> as well. I thought it was like some scam. Yeah. So I was like asking this man every detail about his website without saying, yes, I'll write for you. Mm -hmm. It ended up being legit. And then that was the first sort of green flag where I was like, okay, like this is not just in my head. Like, I think I have something here. I have mm. a like a God-given talent to yeah. write and to be able to tell stories. And mm -hmm. so that set the wheels in motion, but then still I had a, there was a small matter of having to graduate out of this degree that I was yeah. over halfway through and I was mm. like, I've come too far to drop out. So, yeah. um, you know, I did, I just had to, that, that final year was tough. Like I had to, cause I was doing the subjects knowing I'm not going to use this ever again yeah um and so I, I just had to put my head down and work hard and then mm. um and sort of while i was doing that i was writing on the side i you know got really started getting really into social media and understanding yeah. how that works and promoting your content and all that mm. obviously you guys do that now mm -hmm. um and just understanding the whole game like how it works mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So I did that, but then, you know, I had to apply for a journalism degree. I didn't even know if I was going to get in. Yeah. Um, then, you know, I had to tell my parents, like, I had this whole plan. <laughs> and this is where I'll always give my, my mum and dad a, a lot of respect mm. in that they were not closed-minded. Yeah. Um, and they were like, they were obviously like, like any parent would be, they were shocked to hear what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. and um the main thing for them was they didn't actually know a lot about the industry itself yeah um and i didn't either you know i all you hear growing up is that it's a dying industry mm. and so my mom especially was a bit worried about that um she was like are there you know jobs out there um 
dad was more he he wanted to he was like trying to suss out whether this was something i just woke up one day and wanted to do mm. and i was like no no no, dad i've been planning this for two years i was like michael schofield in prison break i like laid out the blueprint <laughs> that this is this is exactly what i want to do step by step and he was like okay cool like i'm on board um and then mom took a bit more time to come around because yeah again she just didn't know about the industry and so i remember telling my mom look if if there's even only one job available mm -hmm. i think i will back my talent and i'm driven enough and i think the combination of those two will help me help me get the job even if it's the only one available mm -hmm. and so i just told mom i need you to believe in me like i believe in me and if you can do that yeah. then let's let's do it and mom was like okay cool that's all i need to hear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so then yeah then bachelor of journalism started um yeah. and instantly i remember from the first assignment i got i was like oh this is this the assignment like this seems like something <laughs> i do in my spare time yeah. and that was the second green flag i was like okay mm -hmm. i'm in the right thing mm. um i'm enjoying i'm looking forward to doing assignments like it's mm. my creative juices were flowing like it was really mm. really good um yeah. and then yeah that that degree was awesome like i took you know so much of the skills that i use for my career now are, mm -hmm. are directly a applicable from what i learned at latrobe um mm -hmm. which is why i would always say um any any young kid wanting to get into media like latrobe's a very 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 good course the oh yeah it's it's very hands-on the the tutors and and the lecturers are very accessible um and it's just there's a human element to it that Melbourne Uni sort of lacked a bit. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, yeah, did, did the degree and then it's like, okay, sweet, you've got a degree. Now you've got to break into this industry. And yes. An industry where there's not many people who look like us, mm. especially in sport, right? Exactly, yes. Mm. And mm -hmm. so it was like, okay, how do, I, how do I go about doing that? I was applying, applying, applying everywhere and not getting very far and and then I moved up to Sydney. One of my um, family friends had a connection, not really, it wasn't so much as journalism itself. It was, I was, my first ever media job was cutting up sports highlights. Mm -hmm. So I moved up to Sydney and I was doing that um, casually. Mm -hmm. um, and all the while, yeah, just applying night and day for all these different roles and then mm -hmm. My mum was playing my agent because she was <laughs> sending through a million applications that like, apply for this, apply for this, apply for this. So oh, I did that's that. amazing. That is, yeah. that, is, that, is peak, that is top tier support right there. That oh, yeah. yeah. It's the MVP, 100%. Mm. And, um, and then, yeah, I actually, funny story, I almost didn't apply for this job that I'm in No now. way. Wow. I, um, I remember reading the Seek mm -hmm. job description thing and it, mm. The first thing I had was good NRL knowledge, and I'd never watched an NRL game in my life. So I was like, "Oh, there's no point in, yeah. no yeah. point in this." Yeah. Um, and then I went to close the tab, and Google did that thing where it's like, "Are you sure you want to close the tab?" And I'm mm. like, "Oh, maybe I'm not sure." <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah, I applied, and then got an interview, and then went from there, man. And then five years later, here we are. Um, so it's been it's been a fun ride yeah it's um had a, had some moments where moments of self-doubt but that's just natural mm. you know i think everyone regardless of what field you're in you're gonna um go through those moments but i think i was very blessed to have a really good support system around me that mm -hmm. um those times where i didn't have faith in myself they had faith in me and yeah that's so so powerful where once you got that you can conquer anything so yeah, yeah. i everything i have i owe to them for sure oh that's that is a brilliant story chris and honestly your story is what inspired me to do the exact same thing so um <laughs> no, i remember seeing all your stuff on social media i'm like yeah. this guy can i do it and um I i'm glad similar... man i'm glad <laughs> because honestly that's so much of that like that's my why yeah is that i wanted to yes obviously like i get to do what i love and mm. that's awesome but mm so much of my why even still to this day is i want to show you know 
12, 13 year old brown kids yeah. who, who might be wanting to do media, mm. who are scared to tell their parents, they can go and show guys like you and me and be like, hey, mum, look, mm. there's someone who looks like me doing this, it's possible. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then all all we can do is just help them. And I'm always willing to do that because I wish I had someone like that when I was that age. Because yeah. then I wouldn't have to go through this part. So yeah, like hearing that is just it's it's everything. Yeah, no, because I remember you and um we, there was like a Lanka game and you and I caught up outside the MCG and uh you asked me how I was going and how you know all the, the sports media stuff was going. And um I remember you that day and I was like, Yeah, I remember you were still still doing this. So this is this is uh really good. I mean you know, you had some top tier support. It looks like your family was right in the salmon, um, as we say. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, supporting you all the way. But like, I mean, give us like, you know, what, what's been the most enjoyable part about working at Wild Water Sports? Like, you know, what, what do you, what's something that really stood out to you? Because um, it seems like you're doing a lot of NBA now. Um, is that what you've always wanted to head towards or, you know? Um, I think the best part of it has been because it's, yeah, it's the world of sports. So you have mm. to, I came in with a very tunnel vision yeah. view on sport. I knew what I knew and I didn't know yeah. anything outside of that. So, yeah, you know, I've been able to develop a more well-rounded knowledge of sport, um, mm. but I'm not going to sit here and say I'm an ex expert in every single one. Like mm -hmm, I still mm -hmm. have my sports of expertise, but yeah. I know enough to get by in, in certain sports. Um, yeah. So that's been a highlight. And then I think just um, working with, you know, people that you grow up seeing on TV, mm. like having them in your phone, like that's yeah. wild. That, that's, that's, that's pretty surreal, huh? <laughs> yeah, it never gets old. Like, I, you know, we have to call like Mark Taylor and Ian Chappell. Like I'll just be in my room on the phone to Ian Chappell. Like, what is this life? Yeah. Um, so that bit is always cool and it's always a struggle to like, because the inner like, eight-year-old me is like doing somersaults in those moments but then i have to try and stay professional and yeah and you know s stay on task um yeah but it's i don't think uh, you speak to any journalist and they'll tell you the same thing it, that bit of it never gets old the fact no, that no. you get that you have yeah. access like to yeah. all these athletes yeah it's it's it'll never not be cool yeah i can i can certainly empathize with that uh working in the, with uh in afl with channel seven but um i mean obviously while those sports has access to the uh the cricket world cup all the all the games for that coming up are you excited for what's about to unfold there yeah i think so i think um cricket's in a really interesting spot at the moment where it's you know we grew up and it was australia and everyone else right mm, mm -hmm. and it's really wide open now i feel yeah. um you know, there's no real one team that's up there that is streets and streets ahead of the, the mm. rest. You know, it's mm. not like the 90s and 2000s where you had Australia and then the second best team in the world was Australia A. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, they literally were, though. Like, yeah, yeah. Whereas, yeah. whereas now, yeah, it's you've still got that top tier, don't get me wrong. Like, mm. I think there's four four nations that are very clear ahead and that's australia england india pakistan i would say mm. uh on a different tier mm. and then there's the rest but i mean nowadays like you look at guys from almost every nation even the associate nations playing these yeah. big t20 tournaments like they've yeah. played they've all played in a million big games yeah um so they have that exposure and i think yeah if you catch if you catch an Afghanistan on the wrong day and you you don't come correct, like they'll they'll beat you. Yeah, come on, come um, on the wrong side. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So I think it's, and then it being in Asia, I think, you know, and those Asian conditions allow again those Mino teams play just play mm -hmm. better in those situations as opposed to mm -hmm. if it was say in Australia and they don't really deal well with the bouncy wickets and whatnot. So mm -hmm. I think it's really exciting. Um, yeah, it's. It's honestly, I, it's gonna, it's hard to pick a standout favorite for me. I think, yeah, you know, on the topic of the World Cup, I mean, you know, we'll, uh, we'll chat some cricket now because uh, that's uh, what in the sounds about. But I mean, on the topic of, of uh, white ball cricket, um, obviously, uh, you know, with with um, the Australia South Africa series happening right now, um, a bit of interesting developments there. There's a lot of chat about Manus Labuschagne, 
um, you know, not making the ODI team, getting dropped from the Ashes, having an invisible Ashes, but he's come back as a concussion side for Cameron Green, scores 80 not out at number eight, goes on to score a ton. I mean, do you feel like that's going to change up the dynamic of the Australian team going into the World Cup in terms of the number of all-rounders, bowlers? Like, what, what do they do from here? Well, I think it's it's only good for Australia, right? Like, mm. it's Manus finding his best form. It just creates more pressure and more competition. And, mm. you know, we're talking about the Australian, great Australian teams of the 90s and 2000s. Mm. You had great, great players not not playing in those teams. Yeah. Um, but just their presence meant the guys in the first 11 always had to bring it. If you don't bring it yeah. for two games in a row, you might lose your spot. Lose your spot. Exactly. So, now, yeah. Yeah. so now you've got guys like even, even a Steve Smith, yeah? Like yes. Steve Smith's a great, great test player. But in terms of one day, as some people are like, oh, he's a bit of an awkward fit in the team. If Steve mm-hmm. Smith has a slow couple of games, he's going to feel minus his breath. Yeah, um, he's back. Yeah. You know, on his neck. Yeah. So yeah. I think it bodes well for Australia. Um, and, you know, they're one of the favourites for a reason. They're very, very deep, you know, A grade bats, A grade bowlers, A grade all-rounders they Mm -hmm. they're a team that's very well balanced um Mm -hmm. and i think by virtue of ipl a lot of their players now have you know they're better at negotiating subcontinental conditions Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah they're a force to be reckoned with um as always so australia you know always among the favorites going into a big tournament i mean on the topic of south africa as well because it's obviously in south the the white horse is in south africa and I guess something that's historically been a common thing with South African cricket is that they're always stacked with individually brilliant players, right, Hasif? Like, like mm-hmm. yeah. players that on on their day can literally like tear apart any team, but for whatever reason, they just don't seem to, you know, come up to the mark, um, so to speak, in in these series. Like, what what do you think is South Africa's issue here um, when it comes to series like this, and even World Cups, you know, chokers and, and things like that? Yeah, I mean, well, both of you. Anyway, no, yeah, you go first. Yeah, <laughs> no, you, you take this one, Chris. I'll, I'll try. Again. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, what's the question again? So, why why do you think South Africa seem to struggle so much in these global tournaments? And even now, like of late, their ODI form has not been like what we sort of, you know, the talent doesn't match up to what's what's happening with them right now. Well, I think it's interesting. I think they're just a nation, into a cricketing nation that's going through a transitional period. You know, yeah. they had such a wealth of talent um, mm. for so long. You know, mm. talking about some of the best players of a generation, you know, and mm-hmm. they were perhaps maybe of that generation, if you're talking about the 2010s, like the best test team. Mm. And they were up for so long. And, you know, we've seen it to an extent with Sri Lanka. Yeah. When you lose a lot of those top tier guys at once Mm -hmm. it's very very hard to replace them you know Mm -hmm. you need to sort of stagger it a little bit and they've lost guys like stain ab de villiers you know hashi mamla it seems seemingly all in the space of two three years yeah and so they don't then a new bunch of guys come in but you have to build a culture Mm -hmm. um and you know they need to trust playing with each other that takes time um mm-hmm. and then that's before we even get to the fact that these new crop of south african players just probably aren't as talented as the guys we mentioned mm-hmm. um so yeah i think it's just they need time um it's as simple as that um it's yeah it's, it reminds me a lot of like what we've seen with sri lanka yeah yeah. I mean, well, if you like coming off the back of thirteen straight wins, so I don't know how you how you say how you assess their current ODI form, given that it is against the, uh, you know, uh, you know, lower ranked teams. But um, on the tug of the World Cup, obviously Channel Nine will be a big part of that. Um, you know, who 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 do you reckon will? Uh, who are your favourite nominations? I suppose, or who do you reckon will, will go the distance? Um, had a had a look at a few sort of expert opinions and uh, the likes of Hasha Bogle, even Ian Chappell, they obviously mentioned Australia, England, but. Uh, India's another one, and Pakistan's an outsider. Um, mm-hmm. Where do you sort of see the two? Who do you reckon will be the top four to, to make it all the way? I think the top four will be the four I mentioned before. So, you, mm. Australia, England, um, I think probably are the two best white ball cricketing yeah. nations at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I would put England slightly ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and then 
India and Pakistan, I think just by virtue of it being in the subcontinent, um, mm-hmm. you know, the guys on both teams have played a million games in these conditions. They know, they know how to set targets. They know how to chase, you mm-hmm. know, they know how to defend targets with the ball. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be those four teams, but then you've got every time there's a global tournament, New Zealand <laughs> is there. Yeah. They're there in the final four. Mm. Um, invariably, they knock off someone big that you don't mm. expect every single tournament. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in 2019, the last time we had this, did no one would have thought they made the final, but they beat India in the semi. Like, yeah. Yeah. They just have this knack for when it's a global tournament, they turn up and yeah. they not always win it, but. They're always there at the business end, so I think you'd have to be a brave man to go against them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, every time, every time there's a complete minnow that does really well. You know, remember in 2007, Ireland, yeah, knocking yeah. off yeah. Pakistan. <laughs> yeah, in 03, Kenya made the semi-final. Like, yeah, that was that was wild. <laughs> and then, you know, maybe not. In hindsight, probably not as much of a surprise, but like Sri Lanka winning in 1996, like no one would have expected that. Um, And so, yeah, you know, could you see a team like Afghanistan perhaps make a quarterfinal if they have two, you know, get hot for two weeks and Rashid Khan's playing out of his mind? You never know. Mm. Um, Mm. It's just there's there's a lot of talent going around that every every team, it seems like, has a guy who can sort of win, win a match off his bat on a, any given day. To be honest, uh, it's, 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 it's very interesting you mentioned Afghanistan because, um, I mean, Hassan, you and I have been watching the Asia Cup closely and, uh, you know, we, we've we uh, assessed Afghanistan's batting and there was a game against Sri Lanka in the Asia Cup where Afghanistan brought right to the very end and um, mm. they lost that match not because, like, they were playing poorly, they just didn't realise they had some time left and they cooked it. But, um I mean, your your thoughts on Afghanistan, Hasid, because they're a team that like you just can't take lightly, right? Yeah, no, Afghanistan. Afghanistan are pretty much. Um, oh, well, let's put it this way. I think, um, Chris, I'm not sure if you if you're keeping tabs of this this particular game. I think Afghanistan had to chase two ninety mm. in thirty seven overs, um, yeah. and they pretty much uh, they ended up getting bowled out in the thirty seven point fourth over, yeah. and they lost by three runs, right? So they were on track to score 400 potentially if they had wickets in hand. Um, mm-hmm. Muhammad Nabi scored the fastest 50 ever for Afghanistan. Um, and we really struggled, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so <laughs> Afghanistan, and we saw it last time as well. I think um, there was a game, it might have been 2011 World Cup, where we were looking like we were going to lose the first game against against Afghanistan. And Jai Warner yeah. came in and hit 100. And it was a real mm-hmm. gritty 100 as well. We had to bat with like the entire batting lineup that we had, right? Mm-hmm. So we've seen them do this before um and especially with these i don't know what it is with these with these boys either from afghanistan or pakistan they they're like incredibly strong yeah um the number one shot that i played that i saw getting played against lanka was a lofted cover drive for six that's right that that, that blew my mind like yeah that's going to be for me the hardest shot to play in cricket because you're not dancing down the track you're literally Lofted cover drive for six, and the batsmen from like one to eight, they could all do that. Yeah, and yeah. It, it, so for them, and then obviously like, you know, you've got bowlers like uh, Mujibur Rahman and mm. Rashid Khan. You know, you have got some good bowlers like Faruqi coming in as well. Right, yeah. Mm. Um, mm. Afghanistan, I reckon in like you know, if not right now, in a couple of years' time, they'll be, you know, they'll be at least like Lanka level, if not better. I think um, it's interesting because one one reason why I kind of rate. Afghanistan's chances, Chris, is because um, I had a chat with Ashton Agar at the BBL draft, and um, you know Ashton Agar reckons a lot of these pl- uh, pitches are going to be very glassy or very like like concrete. He says, and so a- anyone with like a, a really strong batting lineup is going to absolutely just like you know mm. like feast off that. Um, and you know when I offline, you know he he mentioned that you know just watch out for Afghanistan; they'll do some they'll do some funky things, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. out of nowhere. Um, but it's it's going to be an interesting World Cup. Are you going to play any sort of role in broadcasting or producing um, in, in the World Cup? Um, at this or stage, any... honestly, um, mm. we haven't even looked that far because we're really? in the thick of footy. Yeah, yeah it's, okay. yeah, it's yeah, yeah, footy, yeah. footy, footy, footy at the moment. Yeah, um, yeah. I think yeah. as as we get closer, the 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 time zone's not too bad. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure I'm sure we'll probably at the very least live blog 
Australia's games. Oh, amazing. Um, mm-hmm. And then I would say maybe the semis and the finals will probably live blog as well. Yeah. Um, oh, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But no, it's, it's exciting. I have a question for you guys. Do you think uh, if we're talking about all the Asian nations, right? Mm. Has have they already, or when do you think they will? So I'm talking about Afghanistan surpassing Bangladesh. Have they already done that? Oh, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, um, you can ask, you can answer that. that one. I see. No, you, you go first. You, no, man, they, they've good. done that. Yeah, hundred percent, they've done that. Yeah. Especially with um Afghanistan. Oh, sorry, Bangladesh. They have this knack of just like. It's like losing players really quickly, especially in the next couple of years. We're going to be losing Mushfiqur Rahim, or they're not we. <laughs> we as cricket fans are going to be losing Mushfiqur Rahim, Shakib Al Hassan, yeah. um, and those are two dons. Um, once Bangladesh lose those two boys, they've already lost Sami Mikbal this year. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he might be playing. I think he retired, and then the president asked him to come back the next day, so he had to come back the next day. <laughs> you can't, turn, can't be turning down the president, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd come back to. I'd come back to. <laughs> come back to what? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd come back to the president asked me. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. President running a commission and just comes up to you like, hey Chris, you're, you're back in the team. Come back, come, <laughs> come back. back. Um, say less. <laughs> say, <laughs> less. <laughs> say less. <laughs> on my way. On my way. <laughs> I'll be on the first flight. <laughs> yeah. It was a it was a it was a funny one because well not funny because like tell me my tell me people had like a really heartfelt um <laughs> speech as well. Like he cried and everything. Hmm. He's like, Oh, I had like a beautiful lustrous career. And the next day he's back, right? That's what happened. Yeah. But you know, when we lose players like Mushfiqur Rahim, Shakib Al Hassan, uh, and we have to rely on players like Litton Das to come up, um, Salmi Saka, which we haven't seen in a little while, and you got like Tuscan Ahmed coming in with the ball and stuff. Afghanistan have like absolute plethora of really, really, really good players, um, mm. and we haven't even seen the the extent of what they can do, right? Yeah, you know, Rashid Khan seems to be, you know, forever twenty one. You yeah, know, he's been yeah. 21 for about six years now, so yeah. he's got at least another 15 years left he's, in him. He's, he's, he's got that Shahida Freedy birth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That that's, thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it. So, you know, Afghanistan, they're creating such a beautiful culture in cricket. Mm-hmm. And because they're coming from, I guess, sort of like the, the political state that their country is in now, yeah. um, you can only imagine like... You know, because because we saw this as well in, in Lanka as well. Like you know, sport really brings the best out of, mm. uh, I guess, particular countries that are just doing it tough. I think for sure Afghanistan is one of those countries. Yeah. They're doing That's it tougher than any much. other cricketing nation at the moment. Yeah. Um, so they've got like more than themselves to play for, and that does mm. something special. I feel so. I think Af- Afghanistan easy. I yeah. mean, we'll put it this way. Put it this way, Chris. Right. Look, Afghanistan mm. is a test playing nation. They yeah. they have test match status. Okay. So yeah. like they're a test team, right? And they did it within like less than a less than a decade. In t- I'll yeah. tell you another fun fact. Uh, sorry, Chris. Um, in two thousand and two, there was not a single career ground in Afghanistan. Wow. There was, there was not a single career ground in Afghanistan, and the Afghanis used to have to train in refugee camps um, on the That's on the Pakistani side of, side of the border. Wow. So one thing I really admire about Afghan cricket is that they play with such hunger. Like they are mm. hungry. Like. Up until number nine, they will like bat their heart out, you know, against yeah, Lanka, yeah. right? Against La- then that Lanka game, like the- Lanka was like absolutely like they were shitting themselves. They're like, dude, they might actually like beat us here, you know, like, <laughs> no, well, dude. Well, they, you know? if you're talking about a hungry team, Lanka is the yeah. anti- 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 antithesis antithesis. of that. Yeah, <laughs> they are hungry at all. They've had a buffet. Sri <laughs> <laughs> Lanka's love a good buffet. That's, yeah, that's a team that's, that's been in the food coma since 2015. <laughs> Jesus. So, uh, yeah, that's very well said. That, uh, that, that is how often describes Sri Lanka. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. No one, no one never strays away from a Buriani buffet, do you know? Yeah. First in line. Rightly so. Rightly so. <laughs> ambassador. That's it. Ambassador. Right. Ambassador, <laughs> ambassador of all things Buriani. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, but Af- Afghan cricket, the story of Afghan cricket is quite a beautiful one. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they're a team that no one takes lightly. They might lose more often than not, but everyone knows that Afghanistan have their day. They can cause some real damage. And they actually produce they produce a lot of world-class players that just don't have the opportunity, the resources, um, you know. And I think in the formative years of Afghan cricket, they were coached by a lot of ex-Pakistani players. So um, yeah. Wazir Makram yeah. played a part in the fast bowling development. Um, that Inzamar Mulhaq, Muhammad Yusuf... Um, 
these guys are all sort of bringing up that next crop of Afghan players. But there's a hunger in Afghanistan. Like you can see it. Like in that Afghan Lanka game, like when when they got the wrong message that they'd lost the game, like the, like Rashid Khan was like distraught. He was visibly like yeah, depressed. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, and they they have such a will to win, and it's it's a it's a very beautiful thing. And I think it's a lot of the you know other teams that can uh, benefit from that. My issue with Bangladesh is Bangladesh have no excuses to be so mediocre. Yeah. <laughs> Bangladesh have arguably some of the best resources when it comes to, you know, training and they have all the tools there to be successful. Um, what Harsha Bogle once said is that their issue is it's a mindset thing and they love to complain. Mm. They love to they love to just say, look, we're we're you know, we're we're Bangladesh, right? We're known for this. So like, you can't like you can't remove that stigma, you know? Like, yeah, you've been around you've been around for twenty five years, bro. What are you doing? Yeah. Here? Yeah, and you know they are the only still only won like 50 percent of all the tests they've played. Yeah. Um, you know they only they only win at home on on the very rare occasion. For for Bangladesh, it's a very like I don't know they they've created this identity for themselves as oh it's, it's Bangladesh, you know? oh we're playing so, Bangladesh. Well, it's me, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the culture. That's the culture. Yes, that is the culture yeah. of Bangladeshi cricket, and that needs to come to an end at some point. You know, yeah. Um, that they have talented players. There's there's no doubt that the talent, but Every time, you know, look at every Bangladesh Sri Lanka clash, it's literally like a 95% Lanka winning, you know, yeah, or yeah. whatever. Um, and so, you know, there's a time where you can say, Look, we're newcomers to cricket, we, we're trying to find our feet at cr in, in test cricket or whatever format. But you know, as you rightly said, Bangladesh have been around for nearly 30 years now. Um, you know, Lanka was, Lanka was around for 30 years, and we won a world cup at that point, yeah, yeah. You know? I think, so, I think the key, I think the key in going from that minnow status to like okay we're ready to compete with the big boys is you have to have you have to have two or three real a-grade players who get it and who are mm. willing to set the culture mm. for us we had our aravinda and arjuna yeah who even when the team was didn't have the talent mm. they dragged guys along with them and made guys who played with them better cricketers mm -hmm. just just by virtue of being around these guys mm -hmm. and i think you talk about Afghanistan. Afghanistan honestly like reminds me a lot of the mid eighties Sri Lanka. Like they've yeah. got two or three really good world class players and they're mm. hungry mm. and they mm. really play with a genuine pride for the shirt mm. and the yeah. flag and yeah. like it means something to them. And exactly. Mm, mm -hmm. As a fan, like watching, that's all you can ask for, right? Because oh, absolutely. We we sit here like, especially in Australia, you're mm often watching games in the middle of the night and <laughs> the moment you see yourself caring about the game more than the players themselves it's like what's mm. the point of life whereas mm -hmm. if, if you're an afghanistan fan you will never yeah. care more no. about the game than the players playing the game, which mm. is the number one thing if you want to set culture guys just have to care and take pride in yeah and i think yeah that's 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 what bangladesh is missing like, yeah you know, to be brutally honest I think you yeah. hit on the head exactly because I've seen yeah we've seen all the leaders come through from the time of like Habibul Bashar and Muhammad Ashrafu like every Bangladeshi captain has just lacked a killer yeah. instinct a, a desire yeah. to really win you know and they will always hide behind this minnow status tag they're like you know we're still we're still learning guys we're still mm -hmm. new to this yeah. you know give us a break you know I am the only time, one yeah. the only one who's probably ever sort of really been close to that is Shakib yeah uh, yeah Shakib, but, yeah shakim's done quite, yeah, pretty much more than anyone else as a bank yeah, yeah. But he was the number one he was another one all around in ODI for a long for time a, for a for long, long time, long well, time. Yeah. yeah he was a serious 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 player yeah hmm. yeah i mean it's you know beautifully analyzed that that's that's you know that's exactly what we we love to hear but um i think final thing i want to discuss to you with you chris tonight on the, on the show is um in regards to, I guess, uh, in the Asia Cup, um, it's a bit of a more philosophical discussion about, like, you know, where, where is cricket's priorities at? So um, in the Asia Cup, obviously, India-Pakistan is always a big encounter. However, this game, the, the India-Pakistan game in the Asia Cup played in Sri Lanka, it got, like, a reserve day and effectively, like, a third day in, in, in essence um, because I want to try and get ticket numbers and I want to try and get people into the gates. Um, but nobody rocked up this, you know, India-Pakistan game. And, uh, you know, all these sort of Indian um, ex-cricketers like, why are we hyping, why are we giving India-Pakistan precedence over everything else, you know? Like, is this good for cricket? Is this fair? Is this justified? Um, I think, Hasith, you had some good um, stats in uh, some 
um, reports around like the ticket prices for this game as well. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that and you know explain yeah, how that yeah, all went yeah. down? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, the the India Pakistan game was was one of Pakistan's games to be played um, due to I guess like the uh, the political conflict. India are not happy to travel to Pakistan. Those of mm. you that don't know, so. Uh, the A Triple C, the, the Asian uh, Cricket Council, decided to place the game in Sri Lanka. Um, so what that essentially meant was, obviously, Pakistan knows that this is one of the high, you know, pretty yeah. much one of the biggest games in world cricket, right? Mm. Um, and we saw that last year in the twenty uh, against uh, the game at the MCG. I think it was one of the most highly streamed. It was more than like yeah. the NFL Super Bowl, right? Yeah, it's crazy numbers <laughs> of viewership. <laughs> So because of that, what they'd done was um, they dictated the prices, um, not knowing the financial stress that Sri Lanka yeah. are in as a whole, right, mm -hmm. um, with the economy. So I think um, Murali had, a, had something to say in the, in the paper recently as well. Essentially, if you were to get like probably like the top tier tickets, um, that it would be more than the average uh, person's monthly income for, for a mm -hmm. single ticket. So because yeah. of that, if you're watching now, I think they're playing right now, actually. Um, at the time of this podcast. <laughs> At the time of this podcast. Yes. Um, the ground is pretty much bare just because of just, yeah. I guess, sort of poor execution and, and lack of knowledge from the Pakistan yeah. cricket board, it has to be said. Um, yeah, it's pretty disappointing. But I mean, I, I guess, you know, what I want to ask you, Chris, is like, is this a symptom of too much cricket? Is this a symptom of mismatched priorities? Like, what, you know, what do you think? Is this like something, is this like the build up of something bigger at, at stake when it comes to well, um, this kind of thing? Yeah, I think it's a problem that it's not uh, just an India Pakistan problem. I think the I think the calendar's too too packed. There's too many yeah. games. Like, yeah. you know, Australia and England are playing the Ashes one day, and then, you know, almost simultaneously, England's playing an ODI series somewhere. Like, yeah. I hmm. think there has to be a cut of, and I, I know they're trying to fit T Twenty in, and hmm. but you know, trying not to kill off. ODI, so ODIs have to play as well, but hence the reserve there, right? A, it's it's got to a point where it's like there's too much, mm. and as a result of there being too much, the games don't mean a lot. Like you yeah. know, this we look at this Australia South Africa series, like you, compared to an Australia South Africa ODI series from the mid two thousands, yeah, where every game felt like life and death. Mm. It's like no one's even watching the series, like. No. Yeah. So it's a uh, that's one of the problems, and then I think the other thing is you have to talk about the product and is 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 a product more enjoyable to watch on TV than it is in person. Mm. And I think NRL has this problem. Um, if we're just to move aside from cricket, where yeah, yeah. That's they fine. don't get they don't get the crowd numbers because a lot of fans are like, I can actually have a better view of the game mm. and better understanding of what's happening watching on TV. Mm -hmm. And so I think cricket has a similar thing where they, you know, for one, it's a very long game, especially yeah. anything outside of T20s. It's just a long game. And yeah. like, even if you love the sport, it's hard to sit there for like eight hours, you know, mm -hmm. like, so I think cricket as a sport has to figure out, okay, how do we make the game accessible mm -hmm. um, and adjust the ticket prices accordingly but then also for the fans that are okay, they're willing to come to the ground and pay whatever whatever the price may be. What are they getting out of that? Mm -hmm. Are you just paying that for entry and then that's it? Mm -hmm. Like, is it, mm -hmm. do they need more? I don't know, mid in, mid you know in between innings entertainment, mm -hmm. uh, something. I think they need to throw fans a bone a bit because at the moment, yeah, you're coming in and you're sort of only getting the the action whereas nowadays if you're looking at cricket in compar comparison to other sports hmm. it's a it's almost like a concert right like fans you know you look at nba like they're getting shirts shot into the crowd they're getting yeah. free stuff just for attending like you don't get hmm. that stuff in cricket right like hmm. you just, so they need to make it move away from the fact that in that real 90s mentality of art the game is the main thing like it is still the main thing but mm. it's it's the spectacle matters as well yeah um mm, it's yeah. not just solely about the game i think if we they can more, do that we need more cheerleaders that's what you're saying <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's what, what chris getting. is that is what chris is clearly hinting at yeah. <laughs> i said so don't put words in my mouth now. 
<laughs> and then Channel 7. That's what I heard. I don't know. That's what I heard from cheerleaders. <laughs> so what you actually mean is, <laughs> yeah. is what they'd be doing at Channel 7, you see? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Always... Oh, you got uh, me, you got me. Oh, uh... <laughs> no, but look. No, uh, you're right, though. Yeah, you're yeah. right, 100%. I mean, you know, I guess one final thing, I guess, you know, you, you mentioned scheduling. There's too much cricket. And uh, I think the, the way this Asia Cup has been planned is that, a symptom of that because mm. they're playing the Asia Cup in Lanka right in the middle of the monsoon rainy season with the wettest time in to be playing cricket in Lanka um you know so and I it's mean, sad I, because it, it's, yeah. it had all the makings of being an excellent tournament like yes. India's yeah. come down a bit Pakistan's right up there yeah you know Lanka's dropped a bit yeah uh, Afghanistan's up there like mm. it could be in such a good tournament yeah um, and we saw that we're going Last to see something year, very similar with the World Cup, though, yeah. with India. Mm. When the, the games in like South India, I think they're going to—it's going to be a very, very similar situation. So, yeah. yeah, I think I think the people in charge of the game can be a bit smarter. Yeah, mm. um, and I know it's obviously easier said than done. You know, we're sitting mm. from the cheap seats, having mm. a shot at featuring yeah. and whatnot, and obviously there's political things and all, all sorts of stuff, but. I think they can be a little bit smarter in terms of how they market the game and yeah and it's all about how you're going to sell the product to the future generation right like mm. our children aren't going to care about the 1996 world cup like yeah. the nostalgia is gone <laughs> right? oh, like, wait, yeah. i'll make it man <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, like, this isn't the 96 World Cup. I just have bad, bad, uh, you late know, night, <laughs> late, night, <laughs> late night family <laughs> movie, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Every, every Sunday. Every <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> but yeah, like, nostalgia has a shelf life. So mm, yeah, I think cricket does. for too long has relied solely on nostalgia and, yes, you know, fans just being in love with players they grew up watching and mm. they're not doing enough to sell the next generation on, hey, this is why you should contribute x amount of time yeah. um and watch out sport it's, it's yeah. just that it's yeah. a it's a i like that you mentioned the nostalgia part because every time like there's a west indies series happening here they don't talk about the current west indies players no it's always we're, a pass. We're, wait they're always on a past players <laughs> it's like yeah we know they were good like yeah. tell us why we should watch a current team <laughs> current team exactly yeah like every commercial is like you know relive the magic of i don't know michael holding and clive Lloyd. 1979 <laughs> and like this, and the captain's like craig brathwaite like it's like you know. <laughs> <laughs> but look you know chris it's been a lovely chat um we're, we're, we're well over time um and i'm sure we could have uh kept going and going and going but uh look we've reached the end of this uh uh episode today um look thank you so much for coming down there's been a fantastic chat and um we'll get this up on spotify and all your streaming platforms very shortly but uh any final words chris before we sign off i just want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to talk um always good fun talking cricket um and yeah i love what you guys are doing just keep 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 going uh keep keep it in the salmon that's it. That's it. <laughs> Keep it in the sun. Wow. Wonderful words there. But look, um, <laughs> I, I love that. I like that. I, like I think that. you just made new ones weak. I mean, that's <laughs> that's going to make my year, I reckon. Too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, in all honesty, Hasith is the brainchild of In the Sun. And the credit goes to him um, for kickstarting this, this podcast. And we're, we're still going uh, one year on. So, um, love you know, it, cricket, love it. cricket is a sport that never sleeps. So, uh, look, we really thank you for your company once again, Chris. And uh, yeah, yeah um, sure. please let all your friends and family colleagues know about us. But uh, that's all from hey, us time. today on episode eight thanks for your company and it's uh goodbye for now all right see you guys have a good week yeah. right. and and we're done